Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the CFA Institute Research Challenge Finals for the Asia Pacific region. My name is Samantha Bray, and I manage the Research Challenge at CFA Institute based in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the United States. The teams competing today have already achieved significant success, winning their local competition, competing against neighboring universities in their local area. Um, you went on to succeed in the sub-regional competition based on the presentations uh, that you did. And then earlier this week, you triumphed once again in the regional semifinals, offering superb presentations and surviving a live question and answer session with the panel of expert judges. We really are seeing the brightest and best finance students from across the Asia Pacific region. Congratulations to you all. I would like to thank our sponsor, London Stock Exchange Group, for being our global data service provider and providing access to their workplace platform to students. I would also like to thank our volunteer panels of expert judges who have given their time and considerable commitment to support the development of so many future investment professionals from across this region. Our judges are firm, focused, and fair, and we are very grateful for all of them. Now on to the details. Everyone's currently in the main session room. Throughout the event, we will move you into a virtual breakout room where the presentations and question and answer periods will take place. All teams besides the first team will be moved into individual holding rooms. Teams should remain connected in those rooms uh, until you are moved into the presentation room. After your team has presented, you may disconnect and rejoin for the advancement announcement. Only the timekeeper, teams, and judges should have sound and video enabled at any time. All other attendees should remain muted and with your video off. A one minute warning will be provided for the presentations, but not for the Q&A period. As a reminder, the Q&A period for the regional final will be up to 15 minutes. For the best viewing experience, we suggest hiding non-video feeds, but there are many options. So you're welcome to figure out which option works best for you. Today, the teams competing for a chance to make it to the global final are Australian National University, representing CFA Society Sydney, Shenzhen University, representing CFA Society Shenzhen, University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City, representing Vietnam Community of Investment Professionals, and the University of the Philippines, Diliman, representing CFA Society Philippines. Our judges today will be Cheryl Lee, CFA, Arsalan Hashmani, CFA, and Peter Wilmhurst, CFA. Adrian will be our timekeeper. At this time, I will begin moving judges, guests, and the first team into the presentation room and all other teams into their holding rooms. This may take a few minutes, but we wish you all the best of luck. Welcome to Australian National University. At this time, please launch your presentation and make sure it is working properly. Okay, please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a member of your team speaks their first word. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. With a quality mall comes quality roof, ready to protect SCG against its structural and cyclical storms. We issue Buy Guide to Center Group at a target price of 381, founded upon three key investment pillars. First, SCG's demonstrated resilience in economic downturns, a derivative of their solid 10 occupancy structure. Second, we believe SCG can leverage the Westfield brand, underpinned by a connected, defensible, and integrated property portfolio. Finally, the inherent capacity of SCG's development and construction arm to drive visitations. SCG is Australia's largest retail property firm, operating 42 Westfield centres across Australia and New Zealand. In our national survey across three Australian states, it became salient that these centres lie at key consumer junctions, with 54% of respondents noting location as their primary reason for visitation. With a robust value chain comprised of property, management and construction revenue streams, SCG is highly insulated in a pessimistic market. The pandemic disrupted both supply and demand levers for retail property firms in Australia, with restrictions greatly hindering in-store visitations. 
SCG's recent skew to a more service-based tenant offering drove visitations during this period and naturally tenant demand. As such, this newfound reluctance for lease renewals bypassed SCG, being the only firm among competitors such as Vicini and Charter Hall to increase occupancy rates immediately after restriction easing. Of further note is the increasing shift towards online shopping, as housebound consumers flush with government stimulus and, uh, and unspent holiday funds, catalyzing the upswing in e-commerce. However, SCG has dynamics at play to remedy this revenue diversion. Strategic collaborations with entertainment icons are driving the experiential experience, buttressing visitations in the short to midterm. Of note, SCG has outperformed the A-REIT ETF for the last three years with no sign of slowing down. I'll now pass to Liam to cement our first investment pillar. Thank you, Hugo. SCG operate a diverse portfolio with over 11,900 tenants and 3,600 retailers, of which a significant 60% of gross leasable area is attributable to anchor and speciality stores such as Coles, Woolworths, and JB Hi-Fi all three being listed on the ASX. These stores have strong credit ratings, reducing their rental default probabilities, ensuring stability in times of increased interest and rental rates. Despite SCG's inflation-linked rental escalation of CPI plus 2%, which has caused rents to increase by around 27% since 2020, occupancy costs remain reminiscent of pre-COVID levels at 16%. This suggests that SCG's tenants have the ability to offset these additional rental costs by passing them down to their clientele, highlighting the strengths of their underlying tenant mix. Additionally, SCG's speciality weighted average lease expiry of 7.7 .7 years is notably above industry average. This ensures reduced exposures to the negative leasing spreads that may be induced by macroeconomic downturns. Moving on to the next thesis point, we expect the rigidity of SCG's demand to position them favorably compared to peers as the pressures from online retailers mount. This allure to tenancy choice is driven by the Westfield brand name along with two main advantages. Firstly, SCG's highly desirable shop fronts give them the ability to dynamically alter their tenant mix. Attributable to a first mover advantage dating back to 1959, SCG now operate a $35 billion portfolio at the doorstep of Australia's wealthiest. Secondly, SCG's recent venture into the digital realm through Westfield Plus adds significant connectedness between centres. Now servicing 3.8 million members, a remarkable 600k increase from the previous year. This mobile-based program includes several benefits, including information about events, maps, and exclusive offerings. We will now be discussing the construction and development pipeline. Thanks, Liam. SCG's approximate $4 billion development pipeline drives visitations, a key part of our value chain through increasing Westfield's experiential offerings, which are identified in our national survey as the third most common reason for choosing Westfield over alternatives like online shopping. For example, the Westfield Knox development which saw the addition of an outdoor kids play space and a basketball court, had visitations rising by 13% following completion. With a target incremental IRR of 12 to 15%, significantly higher than our 9.1% cost of equity, this development pipeline is highly value accreted. SEG's in-house construction arm further ensures style consistency and quality of developments, with more control over capex costs and timelines, achieving a superior IRR. Although this clearly reinforces competitiveness, SEG is currently trading below historical and relative peer averages, indicative of a material underpricing. So, how is SEG tracking with ESG? Within the environment pillar, SCG secured 100% renewable energy for its New Zealand and Queensland portfolios, with new long-term energy agreements in New South Wales and Victoria. Solar installations have also been completed at various centres such as Westville Tuggera and Westville Hornsby. This will ensure net zero by 2030, supported by a track record of hitting targets well ahead of plan, such as receiving a 4.5-star energy efficiency rating three years early. 
within the talent pillar, SDG ensures employee retainment by fostering a healthy and diverse workplace, most recently introducing new Lifely, Wellbeing Platform, and an ambition forum hosted by the CEO to gather employee feedback. Recently, SCG also achieved a gender ratio of 40 females to 40 males to 20 of any gender three years early, with 54% females across all levels of management. Lastly, SCG's economic performance is backed by a highly motivated and expert team. Around 70% of board members are considered either expert or advanced in skill sets varying from financial acumen to retail engagement to people and culture. Executive remuneration is also linked to SCG's sustainable business framework, with the return on capital employed hurdle increased from 60 to 70%. This will ensure a virtuous cycle of ESG-linked long-term value. Now let's discuss our valuations. Thanks, Chen. Now, ultimately, the factors we've discussed throughout this presentation have been distilled into a target share price of $3.81, implying a positive margin of safety of 15.5%. The blended valuation methodology includes a relative valuation and a discounted AFFO, but it relies predominantly on an unlevered free cash flow and net asset valuation. The unlevered free cash flow was assigned the greatest weighting, considering it is a pure form free cash flow derivation and is therefore most representative of a company's intrinsic value. The key drivers for this model were rental expectations and the discount rate applied. On the other hand, the net asset valuation model is most sensitive to the capitalization rate assumption. We've applied a weighted average cap rate of 5.5% to forward net operating income, assuming a historical spread over real bond yields to consider the impact of both changes to nominal yields and to rental expectations, which are tied to the inflationary environment. We've also implemented a bull and bear case scenario analysis. The bull case produces a positive margin of safety of 45%, whilst the bear case produces a negative margin of safety of negative 8%. The bull case considers the impact of an economic soft landing with rates returning to pre-COVID levels, whilst the bear case considers the impact of a higher for longer rates environment and a significant deterioration in the brick and mortar retail landscape for SCG. So what are the key risks facing our valuation? There are two that I want to touch on here in particular. The first is of higher real yields driving further cap rate expansion. And the second is of an economic hard landing characterized by a low inflation one environment. Minute, think. Speaking to number one first, the reason we haven't seen capitalization rate expansion to the same level as nominal yield expansion is because of the inflationary environment we see ourselves in and therefore the high rental expectations. And that's important for SCG as it provides it a buffer in a low inflation, low rates environment and high inflation, high rates environment. But it does leave it particularly exposed to a low inflation environment in which rates remain high. And that takes me to the second key economic risk of the economic hard landing, in which we see tenants under increased pressure to meet rental obligations and lower inflation linked rental growth for SCG. To summarize, we are initiating buy coverage for SCG, and that's based on our assessment that the firm is better positioned to withstand structural and cyclical headwinds than the market has anticipated. Thank you, and more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Judges, at this time, please turn on your video. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a judge speaks their first word. The Q&A period will last at least 10 minutes. If it is still going after 10 minutes, we will continue for up to 15 minutes total. If any time after 10 minutes, the judges have no remaining questions, we will end the Q&A period before 15 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Hi guys, thanks for the presentation. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the upside and downside cases in your valuations? I guess the one that I was really drawn to was the discounted adjusted funds from operations where you had $1.40 to $5.60, so it's a pretty extraordinary range. Um, you didn't use that as a big measure. It's only 10% weighted. And then what are the key things that are going to drive the bottom end of that valuation versus the top? Hmm. Yeah, so as you mentioned, it does have a relatively low weight weighting, and that was firstly based on the fact that it's not equivalent necessarily directly to free cash flow. Uh, but the, the real driver of that spread 
was um, interest rates. And because SEG is relatively highly levered, uh, forecasts on interest rates, when we have that return towards pre-COVID levels, significantly impacts the valuation. I'll just flick to our scenario analysis input slide. You'll see that in the bull case, we have uh, interest rates or the risk-free rate declining from the current levels to around about 1.5% reminiscent of those pre-COVID levels, whilst the bear case actually uh, increases up towards 5% in that sort of higher to longer rates environment. Uh, but importantly, I think the base case is where we are baking in a relatively stable interest rate environment. So just to follow, your bull case is we have another disaster scenario? Yeah, so the bull case is, um, sorry, so do, you, do you mean the bear case? Well, your, your bull case here has rates going down to one and a half. So I'm assuming that happens in a disaster COVID type scenario. So just thinking through, uh, aren't there second order impacts that would make that maybe you're okay for a few years, but are other yeah. factors start to drive valuations down? Yes, okay, yeah. So. I mean, ultimately, over the past 10 years pre-COVID, we did see a decline in interest rates, not necessarily in a, a disaster scenario. So that 1.5% is based on pre-COVID level interest rates. Um, so what we're anticipating there and baking in is, is a return towards those pre-COVID levels as opposed to necessarily a disaster scenario. Um, but I suppose fundamentally what impacts our valuation, the capitalization rates are um, inflation and interest rate. And so we are expecting that interest rate tapering off and then interest rates declining too. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> what are your views on um, SCG's uh, leverage level? Are they over levered compared to their competitors or how are they compared? Yeah, that's a great question. So looking at slide H4, <coughs> Um, yes, SCG are levered um, to a greater extent than their competitors. As you can see to the graph on the left, um, they're significantly above their Australian competitors. However, SCG have several debt management and hedging strategies to mitigate these risks of higher rates that we currently see ourselves in. So as we can see to the graph on the right, we have a 92% hedging, hedging rate of hedging interest rates at 2.65%, which is well below the current risk-free rates, implying a lower interest rate with the debt. Moving on to the next slide. SEG actually have access to $6.4 billion worth of bank facilities, which is enough debt, uh, which is enough for liquidity to cover all debt maturities up to the fourth quarter of 2025. So where we see the high levered, um, the highly levered nature of SEG, we see, they have the ability to cover all these debts with issuances in euros, USD, pound sterling, and Hong Kong dollars, meaning that they're able to refinance their debt at favorable rates, depending on which bank facility they want to, um, want to take out. Going to the next slide, please. We can see that they also hold investment grade ratings of A, A2, and A with these rating agencies, implying that when they have to refinance or take out more debt, they're able to do at very favorable rates, which really highlights their industry leading capital, um, capital ability to gain capital. Hi. Um, so, given the efficient market hypotheses and uh, given that the um, Australian REIT index, uh, SEG has been outperforming the index for the past three years and counting. Um, don't you think, wh wh why do you think that the stock market has already not priced in um, all of the information that you're providing here? Uh, what makes SEG stand stand apart and or what components are there that the market is already not pricing in? Yeah, fantastic question. And it's something we certainly pondered as well. When you have an incumbent and such a high quality stock, you know, what makes it mispriced currently? So Alex, if you could move to A1, please. Fantastic. So within this slide, we we really put our, our finger on the pulse for three key uh, factors that we believed led to this mispricing at the moment. So the first and foremost would be SCG uh, and, and the retail market being heavily discounted as the threat of online shopping looms. So We've seen that in America in particularly, online shopping has a much greater foothold uh, on, on total transactions, but within Australia, it's quite nascent still. And that potential for, for, I guess, disrupting retail sales truly came through. 
Second was the uh, depression of SEG share price continually after COVID. However, during our presentation, we did see through uh, their increase in occupancy rates that they were actually able to offset set that much better than competitors. And we feel that was underappreciated by the market on a whole. And the third and foremost, which is actually a, a bit more uh, on the Muche side of things, not regularly picked up, was their downgrade uh, in the ESG uh, MSCI rating. So they actually were downgraded uh, one, uh, I guess, tier. And the reason for that was an increase of their attrition rate from 10% to 16%. However, uh, SCG's management were able to jump on this immediately, improving uh, re retainment uh, initiatives for employees. So we are confident in their ability to, I guess, uh, alleviate this moving forward. Thank you. And you talk a bit about their valuation versus peers. You've talked about them outperforming, but um, most of your valuation looks to be in more absolute sense rather than relative to their peer group. Yeah, sure. I might I might continue on with this as well. So yeah, Alex, if you could uh, please go to I4. Yeah, fantastic. So in terms of which multiple actually factored into our valuation, it was the price to NTM FFO. So an industry specific valuation of uh, multiple that we could uh, refer to. So we chose these, uh, I guess, uh, comparables based on industry size and geography. So Center Group is actually significantly larger than its peers, 17 billion, uh, as opposed to 9.1 billion of the next largest competitor, Vicinity Group. Um, and this factored in through around a 10% weighting. So even though it was within our valuation, it wasn't uh, actually as large as what uh, our, our other methods were, were uh, given. And Alex, if you go back to the appendix, uh, please, and then look at the um, F price to FFO at the moment. So as SCG was actually able to maintain the highest uh, price to NTM FFO, this was due to its incumbency as a, a high quality provider, you know, with a first mover advantage dating back to 1954. So we really wanted to compare it with itself. So how is it actually tracking relative to its historical performance? So we can see currently it's at around 13.95, below its historical mean of around uh, just over 15 times. So that was really what factored into our, into our valuation. Just sticking to that one for a moment, I mean, interest rates, though, as you noted earlier, have moved up a fair way. That would presumably argue for a fair multiple having come down. Uh, yes, I'm able to. I'm able to continue on that with well as well. I might actually pass to Alex after I, I kind of give a high level uh, in terms of interest rates within our valuation. But yes, we we, we do agree in terms of it, it should be a normalization. But we still believe that the it's not just interest rates that are really driving our valuation. It's also that threat of online shopping as well. And because of that, we think that the market again uh, is underappreciating that. Uh, value as well. So we don't see as interest rates being the holistic driver of, of the multiple. Yeah, and I'll just um add on to that. Um, With the valuation of um, a REIT like SEG, the net asset valuation is very important. So if we go to F18, uh, please, thank you. Um, in terms of how we factored in interest rates, that was through our assumed cap rates in the NAV model. So historically, we saw a spread uh, between um, the Australian and New Zealand portfolio cap rates above real bond yields in the respective countries. And why real bond yields? Well, that um, both takes into account the negative effects of higher interest rates on the portfolio, the shopping centres, as well as the positive effects of uh, the, the higher inflationary environment and therefore the rental escalations. So for the Australia, the range was generally, generally between 4 to 6% um, barring COVID, and in New Zealand, between 4.5% to 5.5%. In Australia, we see that it hasn't quite returned to those historical ranges, so we made an upwards 15 basis point adjustment on our Australian cap rate. And then in New Zealand, we see that it has just returned to those historical ranges. So we only made a five basis point upwards adjustment. And that's basically factoring in the lag response to high interest rates. And we do have the outlook that there'll be no more interest rate rises um, in Australia. Sorry, what did you say the increase was in Australia? Sorry, last question. From... Uh, yeah, so 15 basis points upwards. One five, thank you. Yeah. 
I'm happy to go again. Um, Westfield Plus, what what does it add? Is it is it the next Qantas loyalty or is it uh, just a nice to have? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take this one. Um, yeah, Alex, if you go to C1, we may as well go to defensibility. So Westfield Plus, it's, I'm not sure if you've if you've been to Westfield or have the Westfield Plus app, but if you don't, to be honest, that would really surprise me considering 20% of Australia's population actually have the Westfield Plus app at the moment. So in terms of its penetration into the general population, we've seen it really increase over the, the last few years, um, up 600,000 from, from the previous year. So what does this add? From our perspective, it really isn't superficial. It actually adds that extra element of connectedness that you need between uh, the Westfield property portfolio. Often could be the discerning factor between a consumer choosing them versus vicinity, charter hall, et cetera. So the things it provides are really things that aren't able to be provided on the online shopping realm. So that's things like an extra hour of free parking. It's fantastic when you're under a crunch and you don't want to have to pay for that, that extra hour and you get stung on the end. Uh, maps, we can often understand uh, they're very difficult in terms of navigating uh, Westfield uh, centres. Uh, they also add uh, events as well. So we saw strategic collaborations with uh, certain entertainment icons. We had 16,000 for Centre Group last year and the app adds a, a sort of information hub for allowing consumers to be aware of these, of these kind of events. So really it's an interface connecting the consumer to the Westfield property portfolio. Monetizable directly or not? It it can be. Um, it, it's it's really what they're trying to drive is the experiential focus. So putting people in stores. So it's about how do we actually okay change from a, a product orientated sales really heavy on on the the fiscal side of things to getting people in stores to increase the foot traffic. So it's more of a flow on effect to visitations down in the value chain, but. Uh, in terms of booking events or tickets for certain uh, events, that that does happen as well through the app, but it's uh, it's 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 mainly for later in the value chain. I might add on to that as well because visitations was fundamentally important to SEG's business models. More people through stores increases tenant sales and then increases SCG's bargaining power. So that's fundamentally important to how they can drive higher leasing spreads and um, therefore also tenants' ability to meet higher rental exp um, higher, higher rental um, costs. So uh, the Westfield Plus brand does actually help bring people in store to Westfields as opposed to its competitors, and it's a clear differentiating factor um, in, in driving visitations and then therefore improving lease bargaining. Thanks. So, sorry, just on the Westfield side, what's the average... Um, tenant lease expiry for Westfield since they are so reliant on Westfield? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So if we can go to the main deck to the um, slide eight. Sorry, go back um, Go back two slides. We can see that these the, the weighted average lease expiry of 7.7 .7 years for the speciality stores, which take up the majority of the portfolios, is well above the competitor's average. You know, we're seeing this as an insulation against the macroeconomic headwinds <laughs> from the negative leasing spreads that may be um, that that may be on set. So, um, Centre Group do have that um, do have that insulation against those those major headwinds um, due to those superior partners um, of their stores. Um, I'll, I'll pass it to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is there a concentration on this um, tenant portfolios that you mentioned? Um, Time. Yeah. Like where the will for and stuff. Time. Thank you, Australian National University. At this time, the judges will take a few moments to collect their thoughts and make notes before the next university is brought in. Thank you. Should we just head off? Is that? Welcome, Shenzhen University. At this time, please launch your presentation yeah. and make sure it is working properly. All right, Jaders, uh, we are apologize that our network is not working. So just wait us for a few minutes, okay? Okay, no worries. I'm so sorry. Thank you, thank you. Okay, please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a member of your team speaks their first word. 
You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Okay, we are ready. Hi everyone, we are from Shenzhen University. Today's presentation will show you by Andy Wu, Winnie Yang, Yoga Yao, and Yu Yu Wu. We issue a buy recommendation for a Tencent with 456 Hong Kong dollar, updated on March 28th. Our investment lies on those points. Economic mode spring to new life, two promising points enhance growth capacity and a favorable macroeconomic environment. Tencent is an internet technology company and its revenue is from three parts, value-added services, online advertising, fintech, and business services. Its massive user base has reached 1.3 billion people, which has helped Tencent to build the largest mobile community in China and its revenue ranks first in the world. I want to describe Tencent Business as the three-stage rocket. The social platform is the first stage. WeChat and QQ provide massive user base for the second stage. Next, on the second stage, Tencent's core business provides strong and stable profit to help it be an investment empire. So on the third stage, Tencent will expand its business ecosystem based on it. As one of the top 10 ESG model in China, let's move on to the ESG part. As an internet company with billion users, Protecting their data privacy is crucial. The company take privacy protection into its product design, as shown with the PBD approach, successfully robust security measures avoid 5.5 billion instances of malicious traffic and data services and rebel around 29 billion hacking attempts, enhancing network security and protecting user data privacy. They make over 50 million companies choose Tensei Smart Business as digital service solutions. This is a tech of great importance to helping the digital transformation of the real economy for tech for good. It uses its technology to help companies migrate to the cloud and digitalization with over 3 billion in server instances, support company in digital upgrading. As the world's leading gaming company, it's crucial for it to prevent young gaming addiction. This has taken series of measures to protect the lead. As a result, any gaming time and traffic constitute a decline of 96 and 90% respectively compared to three years before, make it sustainable. As a company that give back to the community, this foundation has a 990 day with public contributions about 37 million yuan. Berlin has social welfare of a help for the whole society. This has the highest level of corporate governance that can facilitate its future development. Its board shows diverse professional backgrounds, high proportion of independence, non executive directors, and the growing inclusion of female members. Excellent ESG performance brings girls to test stocks value going forward. Okay, for industry part, Tencent belongs to the internet industry. Nowadays, China has the largest internet market in the world. The monthly active users and the penetration rate have all achieved excellent results. Please look at the right side. It shows the layout of large language model in the global internet companies. For example, ChatGPT by OpenAI and Huayuan by Tencent. We believe the large language model will be a new growth engine to the internet industry. Next, my teammate will share more details about Tencent business for you. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Economic mode springs to new life, which affirms a robust connection for users, content, and businesses, driven by public welfare activities, following on the linear age. With the economic capstakes and integration of multi scenario payments, the fintech sector is poised for market growth. Stimulus integration of WeChat and video calls has created a robust dual ecosystem, offering considerable expansion opportunities, given the current less than 3% loading rates. Putting us enhancement to the advertising suit with its recommendation algorithm and creative tools, injecting new vitality into Tencent's advertising ventures. Mini games leveraging high user engagements to potentially elevate Tencent's advertising efficacy and extend WeChat's usage. The increased thickness resulting from WeChat's continuous development has significant benefit to Tencent's other businesses. Heroes are born of the time and environment. We gave two promising points for Tencent's business. One, as world's largest gaming companies, Tencent are dominating, hosts a significant 46% share in the Chinese gaming market. The strong growth of the sea market makes Tencent implement an OS expansion policy for strong growth, and wants seeing over 190 companies to build its user base and explore commercial opportunities in the overseas gaming market. The secure exclusive supplies from its Western, thereby reducing costs. Two, 
This is building services, FS management, and one tree tools, and so on. Alongside the continuous optimization of traditional office software, the dominant position of Tencent Cloud in sectors such as video, gaming, and e-commerce, coupled with its ecosystem empowerment for business services. With robust support from AIGT, AI-driven collaboration tools and intelligence software solutions are paving the way of business services for the future work by WeChat-centric domestic produce, alternating Microsoft and Google businesses. In capitalization market, we could also find that big companies influenced by macroeconomic. For Tencent, since it must get better recently, the Fed and going interest rate cuts and external environments are driving a substantial inflow assets into Hong Kong. Alongside the relaxation of regulations in the Hong Kong housing market and the digital assets, Hong Kong stocks are expected to have fuller liquidity and has been anticipated. China has a set a target of 5% GDP growth at a recent government work conference with the insurance of long-term special government bonds, big economic stimulus measures may continue to introduce. Furthermore, this is business shows the strong correlation with the macroeconomic landscape. There is a great anticipation for the recovery, not only tension, but the whole Hong Kong market. Now, I will continue to introduce financial performance with potential and ample room for valuation growth. Based on historical data and our team's business analysis, we believe the main business revenue is projected to grow at a CAGR of 7.2% until 2027. The cost reduction and efficiency enhancement strategy has led to the recovery of the gross profit margin, expected to reach about 49% by 2027. Tencent is a typical asset-like company, so cash flow analysis is crucial. In recent years, Tencent has been reshaping its cash flow distribution, mainly reflected in two aspects. First, relevant lower investment cash flow expenses than previous year, possibly to decrease the proportion of invested assets for obtaining financial licenses and to focus on shareholders' interests. Second, increasing financing cash flow expenses, primarily for share purchases and dividend payments. Tencent is conducting its largest ever share repurchase to counter the negative impact on its share stock price from major shareholder process, reducing its holdings since 2022. Tencent announced a repurchase plan of more than 100 billion Hong Kong dollar on March the 20th, which will alleviate the pressure on Tencent's stock price from the major shareholders' divestment. Meanwhile, with Tencent's share repurchase and further increase in operating income, it is expected that EPS will continue to rise. Tencent showcased a strong fundamental trend, evidenced by an impressive Pauchowski F score of 8, based on 9 indicators from profitability ratios, capital structure, service ratios, and activity ratios, positioning the company in the top tier among the peer, global peer companies. Moreover, with its ROIC surpassing WACC, according to the latest annual data, Tencent operates within a value trading zone, signifying meaningful profit and earnings growth. Before conducting formal valuation, we built a sentiment index using an LP model, analyzing 83,108 investor comments from Stockbar, the online investors community we adjust Tencent's WACC using investor sentiment through a regression model. Valuing Tencent involves analyzing its main business and investment segments separately, employing a mix of 70% DCF model and 30% SOTB model for the main business and a market valuation model for investments. Our approach leads to a target price of 456 Hong Kong dollars, accounting for both bear case and bull case scenarios. Given Tencent's operational complexity, we also assume key financial indicators follow normal or uniform distributions to ensure robust conclusions. Through 100,000 monocolor simulations, there's a 93.9% chance that our target price will surpass the one month volume weighted average price. Despite a considerable valuation, there are still some risks we need to pay attention to. For risk analysis, we identified the political, market, operational minute, risk, and three main risk. Despite the risk and threats, Tencent still holds a strong position. For political risk, highly depend on the macro policies, causes high probability and high impact. Also, the market risk is present with high probability but moderate impact. Finally, there's a low probability and impact of operational risk. 
In conclusion, we restate our buyer recommendation for Tencent based on the economic mode spring to new life to promising points and a favorable macroeconomic environment. Value for user, tech for good. It's not just a slogan in China. That's what Tencent do around the world. We are not just recommend Tencent, but recommend the whole Hong Kong market. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Judges, at this time, please Thank turn you so on your video. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a judge speaks their first words. The Q&A period will last at least 10 minutes. If it is still going after 10 minutes, we will continue for up to 15 minutes total. If any time after 10 minutes, the judges have no remaining questions, we will end the Q&A period before 15 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Um, yeah, I'll start first. Um, sorry, it, uh, your valuation is using DCF. Is that correct? Uh, you guys are using DCF for valuation. How did you arrive at your target price? Uh, okay, I'll take this. Uh, I can. I can take, take this question. Um, as we know, uh, Hang Seng Index has not perform has not been performing well in recent years. So we did use DCF for. Uh, accounting for about 70% of our valuation, which is to use the MSCI emerging market return to calculate the market excess return. Uh, as it better reflects the market environment, investor expectations of global emerging market and companies like Tencent. Uh, also in this index as widely accepted benchmark for emerging markets uh, makes our valuation more universal and comparable. So um, please turn to the appendix um, uh, D7, please. Yes, we just uh, used the MSI Emerging Markets Return to calculate markets uh, excess return and use the CAPM model to calculate the cost of equity. Then we just make a progress for our DCF valuation. That's all, thanks. Uh, please return back to the uh, appendix. Right. Um. And what is the revenue concentration of this company? Like, what's the revenue breakdown? Is is uh, mainly ads revenue or what? Let's turn to page, um, uh, let me think, uh, business overview. Thank you. Uh, two seconds, thank you. Oh. And this revenue is main income uh, from uh, four parts. The first right. one is uh, value-added services is included is social network, domestic game, and international games. And it's total about 49% of this revenue. And the second part is, is online advertising. It, uh, it's revenue at about 16% of its uh, whole revenue. Right. And the third part. Uh, um, and sorry. which of this is your revenue driver for your DCF projections? Um, yeah, I think I, I, I have adjusted it in DCF model. Uh, wait, wait a moment. Uh, turn to appendix. Sorry. Uh, okay. um, the so revenue that. is um, manufacturers and uh, affecting our DCF model because that we should calculate the cash flow. So mainly, uh, the revenue of the business is totally a, a big part for our DCF cash flow. So uh, it is a projection for our DCF DCF model. Sorry, I, I mean, which of the component will be the driver for your growth? Okay, I get it. I, I get your question. Um, for our analysis, Tencent is uh, with many parts of the business um, revenue. So, for example, for our online gaming market, so uh, basically, we, we predict the future revenue based on historical data and uh, uh, business development now. We, we analyze the um, uh, efficiency of this business segment and the future exception because we, we um, for example, 
For example, Huiyuan model is widely used in Tencent's business, so it may extract a positive impact on online advertising uh, revenue. So we just um, calculate the, uh, based on the historical data and analysis and future expectations to have a expectation, future uh, prediction. Yeah, because uh, some of the main factors such as like uh, loading rate, penetration rate, uh, the information about that in online advertising is not public for um, for the company except Tencent. So it is non public information. We couldn't get a sex to it. So we mainly depends on historical data analysis and future expectations. Thank you. Okay. Gaming looks to be a key driver and it looks to be going somewhat X growth from one of your charts. So if you've based your forecast growth off history, is the risk that you're missing a slowdown in growth in the gaming business? Uh, you mean the game, the game realization slowing down? Oh yeah, uh, I think, let me see. Uh, please turn to page E1. Uh, let me show you some business, okay. business about that. So uh, please turn to the um, C, sorry, C, C6, please. And this chart shows the internet time share of China technical companies. You can see that Tencent always uh, have a strong share, uh, uh, at least 30% of that. So uh, based on this, some um, some game, some in the, some business of that of the Tencent, uh, uh, for example, that advertising, fintech, and gaming, and uh, could uh, have a lot of time spent spend on Tencent businesses. So uh, we think that uh, the revenue could uh, ha maintain a strong growth. And based on our uh, analysis, uh, like some. Uh, for example, the AI, the Huiyuan model, and uh, the globalization gaming and uh, advertising growth, we think that it will maintain the strong growth. One of your charts, I think, showed that the Chinese gaming market had been in decline maybe the last year or thereabouts, that your answer seems to say you don't think that's going to continue. Chart 12, I think it was, or page 12. Page 12, um, it's, uh, I think it's page 13, I think, maybe. Yes, maybe. page 13, thank you. Yes, yeah, so that looks that? like it's going down. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in Chinese, gaming market is uh, have going down because of the regulations, but uh, in the, uh, the overseas gaming market is still a huge market and Tencent have maintained a uh, a strong position of that. So uh, let me, and, and it uh, always uh, invest uh, some companies about uh, in, in the overseas market. Uh, let me show you some chart. Please turn to appendix and, sorry, appendix um, C5, please, C5. Uh, you can see the C5 picture. That uh, this picture is about uh, Tencent's gaming investment cycle, uh, because uh, from uh, about uh, two to four years, Tencent will have a, a strong investment about uh, uh, online gaming company, and uh, you can you can see the C four pages period of high day you game release. Uh, it, it's a world chart, but uh, Tencent have five position of this, and it's uh, its gaming period have. Uh, five years, nine years, thirteen years is uh, far from uh, other companies. So we think uh, in globalization gaming, it will continue to grow. Thank you. Can you talk a little about uh, the uh, emerging trends? So specifically, I'm referring to AI. Uh, we've seen that companies that are involved or are using AI in some shape or form the valuations have uh, increased dramatically. 
So just speak a little bit on uh, what Tencent take on AI tools and how that is impacting their valuations. Okay, okay. for the AI trend, I want to say uh, AI trend, uh, let me answer and evaluation. I will let my teammate to share more details. I think first of all, the uh, uh, as, uh, as, as an ex curate of Tencent, uh, he has said the Wenyuan by Tencent is a self-developed model and it serve as a business multiplier to Tencent. And the Huiyuan has uh, reached into many business structures to Tencent, such as Tencent Cloud, uh, Tencent Games, and many, many things. So uh, Tencent rich business segments provide data support for, the tr for training the large language model. Uh, also, the Tencent large language model will serve the business. For example, uh, I want to, for example, Tencent uh, uh, advertising, advertising when the Tencent, when the Huiyuan is open to the advertising, the advertising revenue is uh, increase a, a lot of things. Yeah, that's all. And now I want to some uh, more details about that. Uh, you, you know, Tencent have a business that is a uh, WeChat, which is the uh, most uh, powerful tools uh, from Tencent. And this uh, MAU is uh, about uh, 1.34 billion users in China. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a large platform and Huiyuan is framing that. Uh, a lot of users use that for uh, some work, business, and uh, I think Huiyuan can help Tencent a lot. And let my teammates tell you about more details about the valuation of Huiyuan. Yes, I will provide more details about the valuation. Uh, cause my teammates noticed before. So, uh, all the business performance affect the revenue or their cost in the cash flow and the income sheets. So, um, the impact reflecting in the DCF valuation or the SODB valuation reflects uh, our expectations for the future growth. Um, cause I my teammates noted notion before. Um, the A the AI okay the AI has will be a um, method we can consider as the method for tension for cost reduction and efficiency enhancement. It is useful for all the business or the, um um as for the latest data, Tencent announced that the Huiyuan model has been uh, of great use for more than three hundred. Uh, 300 prospects for the, their um, business revenue. So it will be, uh, with, we consider it to be a, a core engine or a useful engine for their revenue growth for many business, business part. So we move the revenue expectations higher um, due to this analysis. But, but also it is not a absolutely conclusion. Please turn to page the, Deny, please. Deny, please. Because uh, during our, in our valuation, we make better case and broad case scenarios. And with the whole code discount of 10%, which uh, ensure robust conclusions to take all the factors into account. So uh, we think it is reasonable to have an analysis like that. So thank you. Please turn back to the appendix. One, one of your charts showed Tencent with significantly negative free cash flow. It's a bit unusual for an internet-based company. Um, I, I could get the question. Could you say that again? I'm so sorry. You, you had a chart and it showed negative free cash flow for Tencent. I'm used to seeing internet companies with significant positive free cash flow and that being a big part of the investment case. Are you able to explain their negative free cash flow? Slide number 18 or 17. 18, please. 18, please. All oh, right. Uh, I will answer, take this question. As it's shown in the chart, it is not a total cash flow for Tencent. It, it's just negative because there are three lines in this chart. The operating... Uh, the cash flow in operating is still in a positive trend. So it is increasing steadily by step by step. And we can see that 
the most uh, some changes shows in uh, recent years is that the financing cash flow expenses increase, which is reflected in Tencent, is in the midst of the largest uh, share repurchases in the in his history, and due to the divestment of his shareholder process and reducing their shares of pensions. So Tencent need to have um, these actions, uh, spend more. Um, as they announced on March the 20th, uh, not, lo not long ago, um, they, uh, Tencent will propose a one, 100, uh, 100 billion Hong Kong dollar repurchase plan, uh, which is the most largest share, uh, largest Thank you, plan Shenzhen in University. The Thank you. Okay, thanks to judges. At this time, the judges will Thank take you. a few moments to collect their thoughts and make notes before the next university is brought in. Welcome, University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City. At this time, please launch your presentation and make sure it is working properly. Uh, can, can you see my screen? You can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a member of your team speaks their first word. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, Vietnam is on the right track to its growth trajectory. So imagine an investment opportunity in such a market that has a resilient business model and a profit diversification strategy while still maintaining a superior financial performance. That opportunity is Digital Corporations, the Vietnamese largest provider of market inspection service. So dear investor, we issue a buy recommendation on Digital Corporations with a 12 month price target of 70.5 thousand BND and a total shareholder returns of 28%. Vietnam is on the right track of recovery. As a bright outlook, consumer confidence starts to pick up. Moreover, we believe the consumer purchasing power will be encouraged thanks to the expansion of VAT reduction to 8%, coupled with the cheap money error at interest rate and are at the lowest level. The bright outlook is that, and this year world has a tech to shine. As a market expansion service provider or mass provider, Digiworld has integrated services to help brands to enter and expand into the Vietnam market. With the largest product portfolio, the largest point of sales, and outstanding in-house capability, the company dominates as the segment with up to 40% market share. Moreover, leveraging the mass model, Digiworld diversify into consumer goods to capture more stable profitability. And riding on the recovery, this year was earning half bottom out from the second quarter of 2023, while other peers still struggle to make profit, which shows a capability to secure a price outlook in 2024 and beyond. However, the market correction in October pressed the jewel separate. Reality check, we say this is a temporary setback, not a fundamental problem. Therefore, we foresee an opportunity as the correction even creates a higher margin of safety for investors. So with limited downside risk, we issue a buy recommendation for this year with three key thesis. First, leading position to capture Vietnam as the demand growth. Second, access and expansion to boost office equipment top line. And third, the solid diversification strategy to sustain long-term growth. So now we start with the first point. We believe that leading position would help Digiworld to well capture the ICT demand in Vietnam and secure sustainable operating cash flow. First of all, Favorable condition in Vietnam with relatively low possession of smartphone and laptop in rural area, supported by the rising middle income class, would guarantee a sustainable demand base for the ICT segment. Looking deeper at its segment, we expect the smartphone and the laptop industry to recover from the low base in 2024 and 2025, driven by the replacement cycle and 2 G cut for smartphone and Windows 10 retirement for laptop. All of these catalysts will translate into sustainable growth for the two industry and favoring business with matching position to capture. We believe that leading position with superior distribution network and top market shares and having a diversified product portfolio, Digiworld could be the first and the prime beneficiary of this market potential and spearhead industry growth when the ICD demand recovers. From this, we expect Digiworld to record a strong revenue for mobile phone and laptop segment outperforming industry growth. This will generate a positive and sustainable cash flow even under a very massive segment expansion. This cash performance is 
also sufficient for Digiworld to first expand into new segment without costly external capital, and second, to maintain a healthy financial leverage with low interest rate. Leveraging the stable cost flow generated from the mobile phones and laptop segments, we believe DigiWork has strongly expand acquisitions and open cross-selling opportunities to boost up its equipment top line. We observe DigiWork acquire acquisition, a prominent player in personal protective equipment or PB market with 19% market share. This is thanks to its product portfolio that owns many major brands and loyal customers with a huge number of MNCs and government agencies. So, what a PPE market? The PPE market is poised for rapid growth driven by the construction sector, which we believe to recover from the second half this year, coupled with the expansion of the industrial parks in April by high value FDI if low to the manufacturing sector. And the other two biggest customers of PP products and the soaring role in the medium term is going to create a huge room for PP demand to exploit. And we expect that you will to utilize its robust cash flow and mass capability to synergy with Acquisition Advantage to capture this spring time. Additionally, we believe that you will also benefit from cross-selling through Acquisition customers such as home builders or manufacturers who are likely to have demand for home appliances and office equipment in the project. And as a result, we forecast Acquisition sales to grow at a CAGR of 33% in the next five years and for the post total office equipment revenue to grow at a CAGR of 22%. Thanks to the success for moderate segments, we believe the solid diversification strategy backed by a strong mass capability will sustain a long-term growth and stable margin for digital corporations. On the one hand, the recovery picture is getting more obvious when struggles have all passed from the second half of FY23, in which the Vietnam's FMG market is still riding on the higher income growth and rising consuming class. Plus, we expect top foreign partners with the support from digital world corporations can well penetrate the Vietnam's FMG market. And also, the consumer health industry is also expected a robust outlook backed by the rising health standards post-COVID-19. Given such an attractive market potential with high cross margins, digital world corporations has substantial enhanced capability and prudent preparation from now on to match with. We are confident that the digital world will be the top one priority for foreign partners that want to enter Vietnam thanks to one, with very strong mass capability supported by a deep local expertise from Mr. Zhang Baoman, and two, a wide distribution network with around 8,000 point of sales across the country. We believe this match will facilitate the expansion of the consumer goods segment, which will make up around 9% of the total revenues in FY28. To sum up, the revenues of digital world corporations will be driven by the established segments in the short term and by the young segments in the long term. We believe this diversification also sustains the long-term growth a stable margin for digital work corporations and expect the network margin to ex expand around two percentage points over the next five years. So now let's see how these potential are incorporated in our valuation model. So we apply an equal mix of discounted cash flow and relative multiple to yield a final target price of 17,500 Vietnam dollars, representing an upside potential of 26.3%. Regarding the DCF, we employ free cash flow to firm with a time horizon of five years to arrive at the final target price of 70,700 Vietnam dollars, representing an upside potential of 26.7%. For the relative multiple, we applied some of the part price to sales valuation model to evaluate the price for each six segment of digital. And based on our analysis, digital outperformed peers in most of the segment. Therefore, we add up a premium to the price to sales multiple to better reflect the financial position of digital. This gave us the final target price of 70,200 Vietnam dollars, representing an upside potential of 25.8%. We also recalculate our target price under two different scenarios. And finally, we found digital to have very limited downside risk, as even in the worst case, the action for investor is only changed to hold. This strand and our buy recommendation, we also con conducted on risk analysis, in which we highlight the slower than expected economic recovery and intense pressure from retailers. With the first point, Vietnam's economy is projected to grow by 6% in 2024. However, economy might grow slower than expected, which might create a negative impact on digital discretionary segments. However, in our view, digital will stay more resilient compared to peers, thanks to its light access business model coupled with the low rate of debt. And besides this, we also noticed that many retailers have participated in the distribution market and the offers to expand the value change, which can threaten the world's profitability. 
we observe that you will already mitigate this risk as the company first expands its product portfolio, which leads to less dependence on one brand, and second, upgrades its service quality to enhance competitive advantage. Lastly, the company has positioned itself towards sustainable development and has been standing out to be the ESG leaders based on the MSCI framework. On the one hand, the company has been showing superior performance in environmental and social practices over the past five years. The company has been very committed to environmental responsibilities by partnering with EG leaders brands only. And also, we see a strong interest alignment for all parties. One minute remaining. The co-founder currently holds around 50% of his stake and receives just $1 remuneration. Thus, we believe the company's ongoing commitment to sustainable development will eventually maximize the shareholder returns. To sum up, we once again confirm our buy recommendations for digital corporations based on, first, leading position to capture the Vietnam's ICT demand growth. Second, the acquisition expansion to track the revenues for office equipment segments. And third, a solid diversification strategy to sustain a long-term growth and stable margin for digital corporations. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're still considering an investment opportunity in such a market, digital corporations is the right choice. Digital diversify growth Winning across segments. Thank you. The floor is now open for your questions. Thank you. Judges, at this time, please turn on your video. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a judge speaks their first word. The Q&A period will last at least 10 minutes. If it is still going after 10 minutes, we will continue for up to 15 minutes total. If any time after 10 minutes, the judges have no remaining questions, we will end the Q&A period before 15 minutes. Feel free to begin. Um, yeah, on slide 21, uh, can you go to slide 21? You're on your margins. Um, it seems like there's a huge dip in 2023. What is the cause of it or the main driver of it? And why do you think that the margins can sort of improve you know, in such a great length um, within the next few years. That's number one. Uh, the next question is, how does this margin compare to its competitors? Uh, are they, because it seems pretty low. Is this a uh, industry average margins or are they lower than industry? Thanks. Uh, okay, so thank you for your questions. So regarding the very low margins in 2023, so we have to acknowledge that uh, 2023 is the years of struggles. And uh, so Vietnam is not an exception. They also struggles from uh, uh, from the very low demanding purchasing demanding uh, thing, uh, may, mainly due to the very high inflations in, uh, in the world and even Vietnam struggles from it. So that's why uh, the companies, they have to spend a lot of like SCNA selling expense uh, to stimulate the demand in Vietnam. So that's why they, uh, they hit a very low uh, in margins, net margins. But in uh, next five years, that we expect the net margin to expand around two, two percentage points in uh, and re reaching around four percent in 2028, because uh, we can expect a uh, a better performance in uh, in the in the economy as well. And the main theme of the consumer is like to uh, it's like to recovery the demand. So that's why uh, the company is is like is the main benefit is the main beneficiary of such a recovery theme and regarding the uh re re regarding the landscape when we compare the company to uh it peers so regarding the net profit margins so we can say that the company is superior performance when compared to the other peers in the regional because uh this company is the only one that pursues the mass model so it can leverage the mass model and cross-selling between each segment and that create a synergy. So that's why we experience a better margins uh, when we compare to uh, the peers. Thank you. Just looking at your valuation using price to sales, I guess two questions flying out of that. Why did you use price to sales rather than EV to sales? And bearing in mind Cheryl's question, the profitability margin is very low for this company. Um, aren't you giving it a free kick by using 
a sales-based valuation model given the margins are so low? Yeah, uh, I'll take this question. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, there are two reasons why we believe the price to sales multiple would best fit the business model of the company. So uh, the first reason is that um, as Mutual positioned itself as a leading market expansion service provider, so the growth potential of the company is strongly relevant and is strongly tied with the revenue growth from new plants to the market share expansion. So we believe that when applying the price to sell um, multiple would directly affect, uh, would directly reflect the, this potential of the company. And secondly, there's also a, a lack of comparability between digital and selected peers for some earnings uh, method like uh, earnings or EBITDA because the selected peers of digital, they often incur losses in recent years due to they have to spend more SDNA uh, for supporting the new plants. So that's the reason why we uh, we believe that the price to sell would address this kind of concern and would best fit the business model of the company as well. Um, yeah. Your first answer didn't really speak to why do you use price to sales rather than EV to sales? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, to, an to answer this question, uh, we believe that as the price, uh, as the current price of digital in the market uh, in Vietnam is very volatile uh, at this current point and is also uh, like well reflected the expectation of the investor on the success of the new plant. Therefore, we believe that choosing the price of sales would be more relevant than using the EV per EBITDA because uh, as digital is the growth stock, so it means that uh, the stock price is, uh, is volatile based on the expectation of the investor on the success of new plants and new sector. Yeah, so that's the reason why we believe the price of sales uh, multiple would be more relevant than the EV per, sell, uh, per sales multiple. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, can you speak a little bit on your revenue growth assumptions? Um, there, uh, there are multiple slides where you uh, cover these assumptions. For example, I think on slide 20, you're talking about the consumer goods segment, which uh, represents around 5 to 7% of the overall revenues. And you're estimating to them to grow by 36% year on year. Uh, similarly, the acquisition of uh, the PPE company, um, speak on that a little bit as well, why uh, post acquisition, you expect the future um, growth and revenues to be significantly higher. Um, and uh, overall, I think in the slide 22 or 23, you have the overall revenue assumptions, which are also growing at a very rapid space, pace. So to speak on your revenue assumptions, please. Uh, thank you for your question. For the office equipment uh, segment, we expect the mainly uh, riper in the next five years, mainly come from the Atkinson's, one company that uh, this year were acquired in uh, 2023, because we expect that Atkinson with the same corporate customer based in construction and manufacturing sector, in addition to the only growth of this company from the low base, will be obliged for the two world to uh, participate in the construction ecosystem, including parties such a uh, constructor and developers as well. And this ecosystem often has close relationship and cooperate with, with um, in many projects and often helps his sales demand to seek for new business opportunities and period price, we expect that digital work can expand customer relations to cross sales, office equipment and home appliances. And PBE is one of the most important price for them to enter to this ecosystem. Um, uh, over simply, we currently see that you worry how they have intent, they're looking for a cooperation with CTR, one of a, a company with um, multi-industry business. So we expect that this work can leverage one industry is PPE to cooperate with CTR uh, and from and from a good corporations product in PPE, this work can expand to sell more office equipment and home appliances. Uh, so that's a in in a new south, it mainly comes from first the only growth of uh Atkinson's, uh from the low base and now they open new branches uh in Vietnam. And second, uh, we expect Atkinson can be a bridge for for them to sell surface equipment and other like home appliances. 
uh, and regarding the uh, regarding the consumer goods segments. So uh, we can say that uh, so you can see that during the from twenty nineteen to twenty twenty two, so the growth of these segments was not really good, right? Because so we can see that this is a this is a preparation period when the nature of this model is that it may take times uh, to switch totally from uh, from smartphone and laptop into an entire new segment like the consumer goods. So we can expect a very aggressive growth in next five years for the consumer goods because uh, the first reason is that it's from low base. And like the second reason is that we can expect because the company, they has completed requirements, all requirements for uh, for the FMTG and the pharmaceutical product. And they has also reached all, uh, they has also reached around 8,000 point of sale for the country. So we can say that the prep, the preparation period is done. So now once again, the company immediately signed with three top brands in, uh, in the consumer goods. And that one signal that the company is ready to well penetrate such a market. So that's why we have a very, like aggressive growth forecast for the consumer goods segment as well. Thank you. These are, do you believe management will execute on all these different businesses? That seems quite a different set of businesses, laptops and smartphones to PPE, to office equipment, to FMCG. I, I can't think of another, there, I'm sure there is one, but I can't think of many companies that have added on those types of different businesses. Can DigiWorld really compete effectively in all these different product categories? Uh, okay, so thanks for your questions. So I think uh, once again, the core business of the companies uh, in the past five years is about smartphone and laptop, but uh, there is some like there are some mature problems in uh, such a market. So that's why the company wants to expand. But we, we're confident in the success of the new segments. Uh, there's three reasons. So the first one is that the company, they pursue a mass model. So the company is the only one to pursue the mass model and help them to uh, well understand the, the market, which is the most, uh, the largest pain point for any foreign partners that want to enter Vietnam. And the second reason is that the company, they really have a, a substantial, substantial in-house capability with proven track record from the Xiaomi expansions. And the third reason is that the company has spent years uh, for the preparations to step into a new segment. And they even like uh, uh, recruit two experts in such a market that Mr. Mao Min and Mr. Yi Tong, which have a lot of past success in the FMCG and pharmaceutical market. So we're confident that uh, the companies can well penetrate certain new markets and uh, have a huge impact on the sustainability of the profits. And uh, we can see that currently the plan to expand them is really carefully because they well repaired, well planned for everything. And the new the emerging segment not only can uh, stabilize uh, their business model because they are not discretionary segment. Uh, as ICD, they're more stable, but also they can provide for this world a higher uh, cross profit margin, like approximately from 12 to 20 percent compared to the 5 to 8 percent of the ICD. So, we believe uh, with the well repair and uh, a good plan in the future with the MA efficiency and MA plant, they can uh, well manage uh, their expansions and can bring a positive um, results that we can also see from 2023 and we expect it can be laid like, roll more further in the next five years. I, I have one question on valuation. Uh, can you go to slide 23 on valuation summary? So on your market approach, um, yeah, market approach, it seems like your 12 months PE forward uh, is 24.5x. This is what the price translate to, right? How does this 24.5x compare to the industry norm or industry average of uh, consumer goods retail out there? Okay, uh, I'll take this question. So can you move to the appendix on the EG ratio? Yeah, uh, before that. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, first of all, we 
uh, we do acknowledge that each voice right now in the market is trading uh, with a higher PE as compared to uh, its historical level and also a little bit higher than uh, the average level of the industry. However, we believe that it does not indicate the overvaluation of the stock, but it uh, truly reflects the potential of the company. So uh, even though the company is trading at higher P than the average of the in the, in the industry, next, but we can see that the PEG ratio of the company is recorded at lower than one for all of the years, except for 2022 and 2023, which are the years of uh, recession and the years of uh, like very low demand in, in, in Vietnam. And it indicates that there's still a lot of uh, rooms and being very attractive for investors if they want to invest into the digital stock. And uh, secondly, as earnings of digital is getting more sustainable and increasing because they expand into new segments with higher um, margins, we believe that digital deserves to uh, receive such a higher B P than the average level of the industry because some of the peers of digital in Vietnam, they just focus o only on the ICT market. So, uh, Digital is different. Their earnings is more uh, di diversified. So we believe that the, uh, it truly reflects the potential of the company. Okay, thanks. Time. Thank you, University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City. At this time, the judges will take a few moments to collect their thoughts and make notes before the next university is brought in. Thanks, guys. Welcome, University of the Philippines, Diliman. At this time, please launch your presentation and make sure it is working properly. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a member of your team speaks their first word. You will receive a one minute warning and time will end precisely at 10 minutes. Please feel free to begin. When timing meets opportunity, fortune favors the bold. Meet Shakey's Pizza Asia Ventures, a company that's set to deliver rapid expansion and profitable returns with industry-leading practices. We recommend a buy rating for pizza with a one-year target price of 12.96 pesos with 29.6% upside. Our buy conviction is backed by above peer earnings growth driven by expansion, strong track record and ESG commitment, and relative undervaluation compared to peers. Pizza has cemented its 50-year-old legacy brand, Shakey's Pizza, as the number one full-service restaurant in the Philippines. The company has since diversified its brand portfolio with profit-accretive acquisitions, including hyper-growth kiosk chain Potato Corner. Pizza's revenue is 70% restaurant sales supported by franchise fees and merchandise. Pizza is able to capture both offline and online demand with, with its extensive store network in both mall and non-mall areas. Standing on the shoulders of Filipino consumer giants, Century Pacific Food Incorporated and Universal Robina Corporation, Pizza is set to grow into the shoes of a food service powerhouse. First, supersized earnings growth driven by Shakey's and Potato Corner. We expect a 29% earnings TGAR in the next five years, driven by upbeat sales growth and margin expansion. In our forecast, 60% is attributed to same-store sales growth, 40 to store expansion. Favorable economic conditions indicate that the Filipino is ready to spend. A strong labor market into the next year will bolster private consumption, which accounts for 70% of the country's GDP, ensuring sustained demand for pizza's products. As such, Pizza's impressive 15% pop line Kager is set to outpace the industry's 12, aided by their domestic and international expansion given their asset light and franchise model. We project Pizza to annually deliver around 25 new stores for full service brands and 190 new branches for Potato Corner, increasing total store network by over 50% by 2027. We expect Pizza to execute its plans of increasing presence outside the Fisher Manila and under penetrated regions that are exhibiting standout growth. And we expect Pizza to continue expanding data corner abroad, stock markets, Southeast Asia, and North America, fulfilling the company's vision of a potato corner and every corner. 
Alongside store network expansion, earnings growth will be driven by gross and even the margin expansion of 3 and 7% respectively by 2027. Easing inflation and normalizing global commodity prices this year will drive down prices of key ingredients, boosting gross margin to 26.5% by 2027. Further supporting bottom line is an increase in EBITDA margin, underpinned by its CapEx light model that leads to improved operating leverage. Pizza is also able to pass on OPEX to franchisees, leading to higher operating margins than if it did not have franchised stores. Pizza's CapEx light model will fast track the delivery of new stores, boosting profit growth, and generating an average annual free cash flow of 2 billion pesos. As it stands, Pizza's operating margin and FCF conversion rates are already the highest in the industry, and we are confident that they will remain so, positioning the company for both agile store rollouts and potential acquisitions. Second, we have strong conviction in Pizza's long-term success, given its shared management's outstanding execution track record and ESG commitment. Pizza is helmed by the Po and Gokongwei groups, who manage market-leading brands under CNPF and URC the country's leading canned food and snack food manufacturers, respectively. Their unparalleled expertise in the consumer space drives the success of pizzas in-house and acquired brands alike. Management is still able to grow legacy brand Shakey's through its revenue channels, menu innovations, and loyalty programs. Shakey's has remained a runaway market leader, with market share growing from 2015 to 2022, in contrast with its main competitor, Pizza Hut, whose share declined. Newly acquired brands have thrived under pizza, with around 600 new stores established since acquisition. Potato Corner alone has opened over 500 stores, leading with 15% share in 2022. We expect these profit-accretive acquisitions to contribute 45% to earnings by 2027. CNPF has an award-winning ESG program that balances both risk and performance. Through their shared management, Pizza will be able to adopt leading ESG practices supported by its ESG framework, People, Pizza, and Planet, which is grounded in the UN SDGs. January 2022 marks the third year of Pizza's net zero plastic waste commitment. To note, Pizza and its sister companies are the first local group to adopt this practice. In terms of waste management, Pizza only produced 11.7 kilograms of waste for every million pesos of sales in 2022, which is 82% lower than the average of its peers. Pizza champions employee satisfaction with a project nerdy, which reduces restaurant employee travel times to 30 minutes or less. Pizza also fosters economic growth through its franchising opportunities and collaborations with local farmers under Kawad Kalinga, an institution that aims to reduce poverty in the Philippines. Third, we believe that pizza is undervalued relative to both domestic and regional peers. At a 14.7 times PE, pizza is trading at a 27 and 54% discount from domestic and regional peers, respectively. At our target price, pizza will be trading at an applied PE of 21 times, which is much closer to the domestic average of 20.4 times. Backed by an impressive 28% net income CAGR, its PE to G of 0.8 times offers a significant discount from the domestic and regional averages of 2.5 and 6.4 times. As such, we think that the price level of 10 pesos per share is an attractive entry point. Pizza's five-year EPS growth is faster than that of domestic and regional peers. We project increases from 0.62 pesos in 2023 to 1.64 in 2027. ROE will increase by 5.9% to 18.3% in 2027. We believe Pizza's 21 times forward PE is justified given substantial earnings potential. We project Pizza's cash conversion cycle to end up negative 3.7 days for 2023. Its operating margin is ahead of most at 13.9% and will eventually grow to 18.7% by 2027. The increased efficiencies will translate to an FCFF CAGR of 41.4% at the end of the forecast period. This growth indicates that there is significant headroom to fund its expansion and exceed its current goals. Those margin increases catalyze a revenue CAGR of 14.5%, forecasted using a mix of the industry growth rate and historical GDP to revenue ratio. This ties in the revenue with the Philippines' economic growth and reflects Pizza's brand equity. We believe Shakey's will continue to take up a majority of revenue. Potato Corner will open up to 1,000 stores, and its revenue contribution will rise to over 30% by 2027. We conducted our valuation using a discounted cash flow analysis using a weighted average cost of capital of 11.3% and a terminal growth rate of 3% based on the target inflation rate. We calculated a target price of 12.96 a share, which represents an upside of 29.6%, resulting in a buy recommendation driven by the aforementioned factors 
of market leadership and store and margin expansion. We conducted a sensitivity analysis and a Monte Carlo simulation, sensitizing variables like revenues and costs, which resulted in the sell occurring only 3% of the time, showing that the risks are asymmetrically skewed towards the upside and strengthens our buy recommendation. With all that being said, we do recognize that pizza faces inherent business risks, out of which we have identified three key risks to our buy recommendation. First of all, aggressive expansion may lead to sales cannibalization and lack of quality control for branches. Given its versatile store formats, Potato Corner still has room to expand in over a thousand locations, well above the expansion target of 765. Our projected new store rollout must fall short by 29.3% before we recommend a sell. To control brand image risks, management's increasing frequency of restaurant audits will ensure consistent brand equity across stores. Our sensitivity analysis showed that the share price still resulted in a 19.3% upside even after doubling our forecasted growth rate for marketing expenses. Second of all, pizza is exposed to fluctuating commodity prices, particularly in chicken, cheese, and potatoes, given that raw materials are 64.3% of its direct costs. To address this, pizza can afford to use pass-on pricing strategies. The company also effectively handles costs through long-term contracts with suppliers, inventory covers, and its in-house commissary, which has led to profit growth despite increasing inflation. Even if our estimated food inflation rate is doubled, the share price One still results remaining. in a 16.3% upside. Lastly, the persistence of price pressures may result in anemic consumption. However, pizza has a track record of growing revenues, even in inflationary environments, supported by its revenue-driving strategies. We calculated that it will take an 11.7% decline in revenues before we recommend a sell. With its 28% earnings growth potential from store network and margin expansion, unparalleled execution track record, and ESG commitment, and undervaluation compared to peers, pizza is the next big stock to watch out for. Come and share a slice of success with pizza. Thank you. Judges, at this time, please turn on your video. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. I will start time as soon as a judge speaks their first word. The Q&A period will be at least 10 minutes. If it is still going after 10 minutes, we will continue for up to 15 minutes total. If any time after 10 minutes, the judges have no remaining questions, we will end the Q&A period. Please feel free to begin. Hi. Uh, so you forecasted the earnings growth rate at 28 slash 29%. Um, similarly, your operating margins forecasted are also set to increase. 15% uh, revenue growth rate forecasted. Could you uh, show us a slide of the historicals of, uh, of these three ratios and particularly speak on um, uh, what gives you that optimism that these uh, assumptions will be met, uh, given the fact that uh, uh, a decline in these ratios will change your recommendation to a seller. Um, if, for example, you mentioned that the revenue falls by 11%, then your recommendation would fall to a seller. Thank you. Sure, I could uh, start us off. So, for the historical, um, for the historical, these are their historical um, revenues and income numbers. And personally, we are confident that. We are confident that they will be able to expand their margins primarily because of two factors. The first is the rapid expansion due to their capex light model, allowing them to increase their operating leverage and take and improve their unit economics, as seen here, where occupancy and labor takes up a small percentage of their sales, along with the expected easing cost pressures as inflation goes down over the over the years. The second is their franchise model. Now, Potato Corner, one of their main growth uh, brands, is about 80% franchise. And through franchising, they're able to increase their revenues through selling uh, inventory to these franchisees, along with royalties and franchise fees, all without having to incur too many additional costs um, to, to set these up. And lastly, we did the we did form a sensitivity analysis on the gross profit margins and costs, as you can see here. It takes about an eight or ten percent, about a eight percent increase in our inventory costs before we transition to a hold. 
and shows our confidence that um, he says he will do handle those cost pressures well, even if they're unexpected uh, increases. What slide was the uh, the historical data on for me to review? Just give me the slide, please. Uh, that was. That's the one, the historical income statement. Okay, thank you. Could you speak to the operating margin versus peers? It's, it's pretty extraordinary if they're doing 14% and it looks like most of the peers are in the 6 to 8% type range. So is that because of the franchise model or is it just the pizza or the shakies model is so much more profitable? I can start off this question. Um, we believe that the operating margins really look good compared to peers because of both Shakey's being asset light, being uh, it, most stores are being leased, and Potato Corner being franchise based. So the management's current expansion strategy allows them to grow without, as seen here in their franchise model, allow them to grow a lot this, without incurring a lot of operational costs and capex. Yeah, and to add to that, so as you can see on the slide, we did uh, try to forecast what the company's margins would look like if they didn't franchise the stores. So let's say they just um, kept everything company owned. As you can see here, 100% company owned, their uh, operating margin is noticeably lower. And the other factor to that is Shakey's and Shakey's in general, they have a, they cater to a more premium consumer base about economic class A, B, or C, allowing them to increase their prices and keep demand relatively inelastic because these people can, can afford to take higher prices. And so as we expect cost pressures to subside, the price increases that they implemented to combat those cost pressures before will stay and people will continue to, to, to dine in and come to these places, all while cost pressures go down, allowing them to maintain higher and actually expand their, their margins over the forecast. So the peer group you've got on, um, where you compare the valuation with peers, so th they'd all be lower end restaurants versus shakies? I can't remember, uh, slide 30 or something like that. Yeah, uh, for our peer group, we took a mix of uh, different industries. Uh, uh, food in general tends to be uh, fairly small among listed companies, so we don't see that many uh, that many listed food companies, especially in, especially in the region. So, uh, for the most part, we're gonna see some smaller companies. We're gonna, uh, but it's it's generally it's a mix. So we're seeing uh, large, fairly large companies. We're seeing Domino's Pizza Enterprises, which is based in Australia. We're seeing. Uh, Maxis, which is one of the smaller companies in the Philippines. So it's uh, largely due to the uh, smaller quantity of listed food peers. It, it's a mix. It, it's a general uh, mix in, in terms of uh, market size and and the and the and the classes that they try to appeal to. <clears throat> Hi. Um is there is there a slide on CCC of the company? Historical historical uh, cash conversion of, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit, like, historically, they have been negatives uh, and their competitors have been in the positive, but you are projecting that they would turn around their operations within just uh, this year. In fact, it's uh, improving in uh, subsequent years as well. Can you explain why and what's the driver of that large improvement? Sorry for their cash conversion cycle, am I correct? Yes. Well, I suppose one uh, big reason for that is as they expand, there aren't a lot of direct competitors who can really compete with these companies, especially the Shakey and Potato Corner, who typically have both market leadership positions. Because at that position, they have uh, they have better bargaining power compared to the suppliers here. It allows them to extend their you know days payable, allowing them to improve their cash conversion cycle.
um, is is there is there a news that they would be negotiating on payables or like is this just an assumption from your team? It's mainly an assumption from our team, and it's something that we do expect in the coming uh, in the coming years as they grow and take up larger shares, which we have historically, and even um even in historically before twenty twenty two, as they expanded, they were able to improve their their days payable their days payable over time, and so we expect the same trend to continue over time as they expand. Um, to add to um Pierce's answer. Um, I think their good relationships with their supplier network um, that um, extends their days payable is also due to their management. So they're also managed by CNPF and URC, the largest um, pack, um, canned food and snack food manufacturers, manufacturers in the Philippines um, who already have established um, food suppliers and uh, supply chain network. Um, so they're really um, strong in their supplier network. To add, they also have their own in-house commissary um, under uh, fully owned by Pizza, which is called ba Bake Masters Incorporated. So this is the in-house commissary that provides the raw materials to the different brands. And that means they have more pricing power in terms of their raw materials as well and payment terms. Just looking at this page, um, the rise in margins is obviously pretty critical for your valuation. Um, the gap between gross margin and EBITDA margin, it's 5.3% of sales in 2022, and it goes down to only 1.5% of sales in 27. So what, what's driving that massive compression? Yeah, so I guess I'll start, start those off. Um, it would be mostly due to their uh, business model, right? The way they we expect them to rapidly expand, and actually they'll be incurring you know, capital expenditures with it as well. And so the extra depreciation costs that they, they add on top of it is what's uh, progressing the market. The larger depreciation costs, rather, that they'll incur over time as they expand and set up more stores will uh, increase or will decrease the gap between the two. I'm not sure I quite follow how, but okay, um, yeah, okay. Uh, what part of the business gives you the most trouble? Uh, which area, so we've talked about all the good, let's talk about a little bit about the bad. Uh, we've spoken about the risks as well, uh, but specifically, uh, which area of the business um, would alter or give you second thoughts about investing in this company? So I guess to start off this question, we can go to our risks. Um, as a consumer facing company, we do believe that inflation will definitely be a significant risk uh, as we, are, we sell food. Uh, however, we believe Shakey's uh, pizza as a whole can, is best positioned to combat that given that they have this combination of full service restaurant and kiosk uh, uh, brand, brands, which can help them sell to different kinds, a, a large addressable market without the risk of the high price increases due to in inflation or commodity prices. Um, I would also like to add, can we go to slide 115 or F3? Okay, so despite significant reductions, we do acknowledge that they are also lagging behind in terms of non-renewable energy consumption at almost double the industry average um, compared to Jollibee Food and Figaro, its peers. Um, nonetheless, the management has plans of incorporating um, renewable energy, which will drive down their energy consumption in the long run. And we are also confident that they will be able to execute this as we are already seeing shifts in their sister company, CNPF. Um, so they are currently investing to build solar operations and they have also been using coconut shells as biomass fuel to um, fuel their operations. How important is the international expansion? If you go out a few years, is it a big part of revenue or it's still very small? 
Um, their in, their international expansion um is we project to be fifteen percent um of revenues um which is their current ratio now so uh eighty five percent of their sales comes from their domestic stores and then fifteen percent from their international stores and we foresee that potato corner um having the international footprint that it already has will be the one driving that international expansion. And are they profitable overseas, as profitable? Yes, I happily take this question. We are confident in pizza, specifically Petito Corner's performance outside of the country because they have been, for three reasons, one, they have Perform, they've been performing strongly in the CN market, given that it's 70% of their global store breakdown. And they even reached a milestone of 100 branches in Thailand just last year. And second, they have been able to localize menu. Ever since, even before acquisition, the original owners of Potato Corner have started expansion on internationally since 2006. And the research and development has been continuously rolling out new flavors, halal menus for the different kinds of cultural differences to account for them. And for third, management expertise in international business, we are confident in them given they have CNPF, which already exports tuna canned goods and URC exporting uh, snacks and beverages and other um, food I retail items. So yes, we are confident. Thanks. Sorry, um, how, how, how is margins differ uh, international versus uh, domestic? Well, as far as the exact number, it's not something that's really made available. However, we are confident, we do remain confident that they will remain relatively profitable, at least in a similar level to the others, as for the factor stated earlier. That they're able to uh, uh, maybe to tweak my question, do you think domestic market is has higher margins versus the global ones or vice or the other way around i thank you university of the philippines dilliman all four teams have now presented at this time the judges will begin deliberating please make mm -hmm. sure to rejoin the zoom session by 145 to hear which teams are advancing to the global final that Welcome back and congratulations on completing this final round of the regional competition. Um, and we all have seen some remarkable presentations today. The level of thought, attention to detail, insightful analysis, teamwork, presentation skills, and all of that. Uh, you have impressed us more than, than we can say. Um, we just wanna remind you to use this experience, put it on your CV, highlight it in job interviews and applications, be ready to talk about what you learned, what went well, things that you would do differently. Um, any thoughtful reflection is the surest way to impress an interviewer for this. Um, every team today has already enjoyed significant success in this competition, but sadly only two can proceed to the global final of the CFA Institute Research Challenge. So the judges have scored all teams, the results are in, and the two teams that will be representing the Asia Pacific region at the global final in Warsaw, Poland on 16 May are Australian National University and University of the Philippines, Diliman. Thank you to all the teams, academic advisors, CFA societies, and judges for your hard work and dedication. Um, thank you again to our global data service provider, London Stock Exchange Group. Uh, congratulations again to the two teams advancing to the global final. I will be in contact with you all um, shortly after this meeting ends and then with more information next week around travel. And a sincere well done to everyone involved in the competition. Thank you.